All right, I think we'll get started. And we know those, there'll be some others who are joining as they get out of class. But I would like to say good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jill Rockwell and I'm the Dean of Students at the Batten School. Thanks to everyone who is joining us today. Our students, our faculty, staff, alumni, and other members of the UVA Greater Charlottesville communities. While I have worked in college administration for many decades, in my previous life, I was an employment attorney, and thus the impetus for today's Baton Hour, the passing of Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, on September 18th, was really personally heartbreaking to me. We knew we wanted to quickly rearrange our existing Baton Hour schedule to invite a special guest to talk about the implications of Justice Ginsburg's death and the future of the court. And when we were brainstorming, there was one person who was suggested by virtually everyone with whom I spoke, and that is Dr. Barbara Perry. And indeed, as sad as I am about the passing of Justice Ginsburg, I have to say it was also very heartening to see that Dr. Perry, fueled in part by her own admiration for Justice Ginsburg, and I suspect her love for UVA students, did not even hesitate in clearing her calendar to be with us today. Given the incredible depth of her experience and research, Dr. Barbara Perry is really uniquely qualified to speak with us about Justice Ginsburg's legacy, and I'm so truly thankful for her time. She is the Gerald L. Beliles Professor and Director of Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, where she co-directs the Presidential Oral History Program. Dr. Perry has authored or edited 14 books on presidents, first ladies, the Kennedy family, the Supreme Court, and civil rights and civil liberties. She previously served as a US Supreme Court Fellow and has worked for both Republican and Democratic members of the Senate. Dr. Perry is a native of Louisville, Kentucky, and she earned her PhD in government from the University of Virginia, a master's degree in politics, philosophy, and economics from Oxford University, and a BA degree in political science with highest honors from the University of Louisville. After Dr. Perry shares some introductory remarks with us, we'll be opening the floor to questions. I ask you to please use the Q&A feature below, and we will hope to get to as many questions as possible. Now, if you please, Join me in thanking Dr. Perry for her time and welcoming her for her remarks. Well, thank you so much, Rockwell. And I'm going to now say that you're my newest BFF, my <laughs> Jill, and I hope you'll call me Barbara. And we bonded uh, immediately when we began uh, chatting by phone about this possibility of, of doing this talk today. So I just want to thank Jill for reaching out to me and thank Batten for putting on these Batten hours, which are uh, so interesting, especially at this time when we're all anxious about everything, it seems, but we're also anxious to uh, link up with others. And this is a great way to do it virtually and, and to stay safe. So thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in this afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to keep my uh, opening remarks fairly brief, maybe 15 minutes or so, to just uh, tell you about the themes for today of uh, Justice Ginsburg's legacy and then also what her passing means for the future of the court, uh, particularly if she is replaced by Amy Coney Barrett. Um, but I wanted to throw a question out to you to begin with and that is the following. Where were you and what were you doing and what were your thoughts when you heard that Justice Ginsburg had passed? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. And it doesn't matter uh, what your politics are, your ideology, uh, if you are on the same side of the spectrum as Justice Ginsburg, uh, you were probably very sad. Um, you might have seen her in heroic terms. Uh, she certainly had become a pop culture icon in the last few years of her life. Um, on the other hand, if you were on the other side of the spectrum, um, you might have actually not been happy that she had passed, but happy that she was no longer going to be on the court. Um, and I had had lunch with some members of the interest group, the Heritage Foundation uh, at a Miller Center uh, program that we co-ran with them in Washington on the first 100 days of the Trump administration. And uh, there were a number of men there, part of the Heritage Foundation, and they were exclaiming with glee how they couldn't wait to replace Justice Ginsburg. So while some parts of our society, of course, would be very sad at this passing, there were other parts of our society and people in politics who were uh, glad to have this opportunity to reshape the court. So more on that in just a moment. But the reason I, I started with that question is that it, it, it reminded me a little bit that, that there are times in our 
politics, in our celebrityhood in the United States or around the world, uh, or in sports, where people will say they distinctly remember where they were when they heard so-and-so had passed. Um, for people who are my age and just a bit older or considerably older, uh, it will always be when they heard President Kennedy had been shot. Um, for my parents' generation, it was where they were when they heard that FDR had died because he was the only president they had known because he'd been in office for 12 years. Uh, for some people, that kind of experience was when Princess Diana was so tragically killed in the car accident in 1997, or most recently for a sports celebrity, Kobe Bryant. Um, so there are just certain people who have such an impact on, on the consciousness of Americans or people around the world that those moments are burned into our psyche. And, and I think this will be true of Justice Ginsburg. Uh, and this is quite unusual for a Supreme Court justice. When I was a fellow at the court in the mid 1990s, someone did a survey uh, that more, and it showed that more Americans could name the judge who at that time was on the people's court on TV than can name even one justice on the Supreme Court. 30 plus percent of the people could name one justice. And at that time, it was Justice Sandra Day O'Connor uh, because she was at that time sort of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg of that era as the first woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court. And it was before RBG became notorious RBG. So I just think it's important to note that already uh, Justice Ginsburg has secured her place in history. She would have secured her place in history, though, even if she had never been a judge, if Jimmy Carter had never appointed her to the D.C. Circuit, the uh, Court of Appeals that is a bit of a proving ground for those moving up eventually to the U.S. Supreme Court, or if Bill Clinton had never appointed her uh, to be a Supreme Court Justice in 1993. And she might not have become a pop culture icon, but she certainly would have secured her place in legal history and in gender equity history. So I'm sure most of you know, or certainly since she passed, have been reading about the impact that she had on gender equity cases. And I always stress gender equity rather than women's rights. If it had been only women's rights that she had been successful in achieving, that would have been enough. But it was true gender equity. That is, she fought for the equal treatment by the law uh, of men and women. And so sometimes, the people she was representing at the Supreme Court when she was head of the Women's Rights Project for the ACLU were men. They were men who had been uh, unequally treated by our laws, by social security laws, for example, or by the military. Um, and so she wanted to make sure that men and women alike were treated equally uh, under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And just that alone in 19, um, early 1970s, she had uh, written the brief for a case called Reed versus Reed that was the first case in which the US Supreme Court agreed that when gender was involved, it should be uh, viewed under the Equal Protection Clause uh, of the 14th Amendment. And that was in itself a major breakthrough. So Justice Ginsburg brought six cases uh, to the US Supreme Court, argued most of them before the court, uh, and won all but, uh, but one of them. So again, she would have been uh, in the annals of gender equity law just on that alone. But the fact that she served for 13 years on the Court of Appeals, uh, interestingly established a record as a moderate liberal, in part because the feminist movement um, was becoming more radicalized. Uh, she was viewing men and women similarly, that she thought was her great battle, but the feminist movement was moving in such a way that it was recognizing differences among men and women. So sometimes uh, there were those who were in that part of the feminist movement in the 1970s and 80s who actually didn't support her for the U.S. Supreme Court, ironically enough, when uh, Bill Clinton decided to name her. How did that come about? Well, it came about because uh, he had actually, he had said he wanted someone who was a moderate liberal as he was. He wanted someone, he said, with a big heart, uh, very similar, he said, to uh, Earl Warren, uh, who had, was a Republican, but appointed by Eisenhower and turned out to perpetrate a revolution in rights, particularly criminal rights, but all individual rights across the board in the 1950s and 60s. The first person, or among the first persons he thought about was the governor of New York, Mario Cuomo. Uh, he stepped away from consideration. Next was uh, Stephen Breyer, who was on the appeals court in Boston. And he came down uh, from Boston on the train, came to be interviewed by Bill Clinton. And the interview just didn't have a sparkle to it, in part because uh, Judge 
that time, Judge Breyer had um, fallen off his bicycle. He had a, a run in with a car <laughs> in Harvard Yard uh, in uh, Cambridge, and he was not feeling well, and the interview just didn't go well. And so Bernie Nussbaum, who was White House counsel, and we've recorded this in the Miller Center's uh, oral history, which you can link to, by the way, if you go to uh, Thoughts from the Lawn. I've just uh, published there with uh, the help of Althea Brooks uh, from Lifetime Learning, a piece on, on Justice Ginsburg. And you can link to uh, this oral history. Bernie Nussbaum tells the story of advocating uh, for Ruth Bader Ginsburg to Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton then calls her in for an interview and he's just bowled over uh, by her and particularly by her life story. Uh, and that's how she gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. She was approved by the Senate in 1993 by a vote of 96 to 3. Just imagine, she's one of the last members of the court to join in a bipartisan manner. As it turns out, the last person to have a bipartisan vote was Stephen Breyer. The next year, things worked out better for him in the interview, and so he was put on the court the next year, uh, which just is a, a, less, a life lesson. He came to Justice Ginsburg's inauguration uh, and showed you know, no bitterness or ill feelings that he was passed over. And then sure enough, the next year, 1994, he was one of the two Clinton appointees to the US Supreme Court. Um, with that, I want to share um, a personal story before we get to Justice Ginsburg's uh, legacy for the Supreme Court. And that is that because of my fellowship at the court in the mid-90s when she had just joined the court, um, I got to know, not as, as BFS, but I got to know of, and sometimes they would remember me, the justices at that time, because I would work with them, uh, particularly on bringing uh, VIPs to the court from around the world would come to see this jewel in our judicial crown, the jewel in our constitution, the US Supreme Court. Uh, and I also should add that through uh, Professor Henry Abraham, uh, one of the most renowned constitutional law Supreme Court scholars in political science uh, who taught here at the university in what was then called the government department for a quarter century and sadly just, just passed uh, in February. Uh, but he knew Justice Ginsburg very well because they had served together uh, on the bicentennial of the Constitution Commission back in the 1980s and that group had traveled to Israel on an exchange and so he had gotten to know her uh, on that exchange and then whenever I might be at the court and and Professor Abraham was at the court, uh, he would reintroduce me each time to Justice Ginsburg. But I got to know her a little bit better. Uh, in 2005, I gave a lecture at the Supreme Court on church and state and the Jeffersonian uh, elements of church and state separation. And the Historical Society picked Justice Ginsburg to introduce me. So as you can imagine, I was thrilled. But she was famously known to be very shy and introverted. And I did my best to make conversation with her in the green room prior to going into the magnificent courtroom to give my lecture. But uh, she, I just couldn't really get her to open up. And then she gave me a, a, a rather brief introduction, not nearly so fulsome as, as Jill's today for me. And one of my friends came up to me afterwards and said, that was kind of a brief introduction. And I said, it's okay, it was Justice Ginsburg. That's what, if she had just said, here's Barbara Perry, that would have been enough for me. But I got back to Charlottesville and that was on a Monday night. And then that Friday, um, that Saturday, Friday into Saturday morning, um, I got the very sad news that my mother had passed away. And uh, she lived a very good, long, wonderful life. And I had the most wonderful parents, um, but she had been ill. And so it was not a shock, but uh, kind of like with Justice Ginsburg, you, you know, you're never ready for these, these passings. And I had to drive back to Louisville by myself. I couldn't get a flight and I was just devastated, but I went to my mailbox and got the mail. And there was a typed letter from Justice Ginsburg congratulating me on giving this lecture and telling me that she really liked it and she wanted a copy of it. That gave me the strength to drive 10 hours from here to Louisville through the wilds of West Virginia in the dark of night. When I got back from, from Louisville, there was a handwritten note in my mailbox from Justice Ginsburg and I would like to read it to you because it's so meaningful to me. From the Chambers of Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, April the 12th, 2005. Dear Barbara, even when one is all grown up, the death of a parent is a loss like no other, but you have a store of memories to hold dear. May you continue to thrive in your work and life just as your mother would have willed. With sympathy, RBG. So I keep this in my den and if I ever need inspiration or just want to think about 
my mother, uh, because even though Justice Ginsburg didn't really know me, she just captured my relationship that I had with my mother. And I knew how important that was for Justice Ginsburg because she had lost her own mother to cancer um, the day before she um, graduated from high school. Her mother was buried and she could not, therefore Ruth could not give her um, valedictory speech to her high school class, even though she was the number one graduate in her high school class. And it, funny enough, and appropriately enough, it was the James Madison High School uh, that she attended in New York. Um, so that will always be my memory. And now that she has passed, I know that those of us who want to try to follow in her footsteps um, can take inspiration from that. So if we follow in her footsteps, if you are again prone to uh, think in terms of, of how she did about gender, gender equity, uh, if you find yourself on the same side of the ideological spectrum as she uh, on issues that are particularly important today. Um, if you go through uh, her work, her body of work on the Supreme Court, um, several cases really pop out. Um, you can just take any topic that you want that has a clear liberal conservative side to it and you'll find her on the liberal side. We should note, however, the court hears now uh, fewer than 100 cases uh, per year. They have total discretion over their docket. And so most of the cases that come to them that are either coming from state Supreme Courts or coming through the federal system from the courts of appeals, the court does not hear those reviews. And so the lower court decision stands either from a state Supreme Court or a U.S. Court of Appeals. Um, also remember that a lot of these cases don't necessarily break into liberal conservative political uh, positions on the spectrum. So it's not to say that once a justice gets there, if they have a conservative or liberal background, they just can phone it in and say, yeah, you know how I'm going to vote. There are instances when they are uh, unanimous in their views and they have a nine to nothing vote. And there are times when, again, they don't split along these liberal conservative lines because the case might be highly technical or it's just not particularly political and come into these categories that we think about. But the cases that come to mind where she had such an impact is the famous VMI case, the Virginia Military Institute case right here in Virginia. Uh, the Citadel and VMI um, since their founding had admitted only men uh, and there were women who wanted to go to these uh, institutes. And so a, a woman who had been denied admission to VMI uh, brought a suit uh, to say that this was a violation of uh, the 14th Amendment and he, her equal protection uh, clause rights. Uh, the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth had created what they said was a separate but equal leadership program at Mary Baldwin uh, College over in Stanton, Virginia, but women made the argument that that was not VMI and uh, separate e but equal had gone by the wayside for race and it should go by the wayside for women. And so in that instance, uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote for a seven to one court. So even though you would think, oh, it's a gender issue, I bet the conservatives uh, would vote against that. Uh, no, you should note that one did, Justice Scalia, who was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dear friend. Uh, uh, they had served together on the Court of Appeals, and even though they were from opposite ends of the spectrum, they really loved each other uh, as, as BFFs. They, they loved opera, they loved food, uh, their spouses, their mutual spouses would get together. They celebrated every uh, New Year's Eve together, and they would go to operas together, and they even served as extras in the chorus uh, in an opera in Washington. And then an opera was written about their friendship. Uh, so I think that's important important to know in this day of polarization. So Justice Scalia dissented in the VMI case. The vote was seven to one because Justice Thomas's son at the time was a student at VMI. And so Justice Thomas recused himself from, from that case. But it was, a, a, again, a victory for, for women uh, to have the Equal Protection Clause applied to them and to be treated equally as, as men. And that, of course, now they are um, able to attend VMI. Another case that, that really pops to my mind, because it showed that even in dissent, Justice Ginsburg could make a big difference. And I, I was there for this dissent that she read from the bench. I would teach teachers about the court for many years and we would take them, uh, particularly at the end of the term when a lot of the important blockbuster cases come down. So I have in my mind's eye, this picture of sitting in the beautiful courtroom uh, that holds about 300 people, but it has kind of a church-like setting to it. And Justice Ginsburg reading her decision, her dissent from the bench uh, in the Lily Ledbetter case. Lily Ledbetter had worked for the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company for many years, 
And after she retired, um, I guess in just a conversation with some friends of hers who had retired, she discovered that her male colleagues who had retired were making a lot more in their pensions than she was. And she discovered the reason for that was that she had been paid less than they for the entirety of her career uh, because she was a woman. She was not given equal pay to the equal work she had done alongside men. But she didn't know it at the time. She only found out about it after she had retired and it was having a big impact uh, on her pension. So she brought this case under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which bans uh, gender discrimination in the workplace. And there was a ruling within uh, the federal regulations of that uh, law, the 64 Civil Rights Act, that as soon as you found out that you were being discriminated against, you had 180 days to report this uh, under the 64 Civil Rights Act. Well, 180 days had long passed since the first instance of her being discriminated against. She was now long retired. Uh, and so the court, led by Justice Alito, a conservative, said, somewhat what Amy Coney Barrett was saying the other day that Justice Scalia and she believe, which is that you have to follow the law. The justices are not policymakers. They're not Congress. They can't change the law even if they disagree with it. But Justice Ginsburg dissented. She said, this is wrong. And so she, in her dissent, she said, the Congress needs to change this law. If the court isn't going to do something different in interpreting it, then the Congress needs to change it. And so this was in 2007. The person who took up the cause was then Senator Hillary Clinton of New York. And she helped to lead through the Senate and eventually get passed in the House, the so-called Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act that changed that part of the Civil Rights Act of 64 because there are many times that people are being treated unequally in their pay, but they just don't know the difference. And so that was the first law that um, Barack Obama in 2009 signed into law, the first bill that he signed into law uh, when he came into the White House in January of 2009 with Lily Ledbetter standing next to him. So that's another example. One other case that I just wanted to mention also in dissent for uh, Justice Ginsburg that did not have an impact in terms of how things changed or didn't change uh, in, in our law or how they changed or didn't change in an outcome of a case, and that is Bush versus Gore in 2000. The reason I bring it up is because uh, we could very well have some litigation similar to that in the upcoming election on November the 3rd. Um, won't go into all of the complexities of that case, but suffice to say that the majority on the court, um, led by Chief Justice Rehnquist, a conservative majority, uh, believed that the recount in Florida that was so at issue in that case, because whoever won that popular vote in Florida in 2000, either George W. Bush or Vice President Al Gore would therefore win the Electoral College and win the presidency. As it turns out, there will never really have a, a true count, but probably the, the record shows that there was a differentiation of between three and 500 votes total across the entire Sunshine State in George Bush's favor. But the issue for Bush versus Gore at the Supreme Court was whether the recount should stop in Florida. And actually five members of the court said, yes, it should stop. There were two members of the court who said, it needs to be done in a, in a better way, and it should probably stop if it's not gonna be done in a better way that doesn't violate equal protection. But those were two liberals who, in essence, joined the conservatives on, yes, it should probably stop. But Justice Ginsburg was one of two justices who said, no, the vote recount should not stop. There's not a, a, any kind of violation of equal protection here. And the key point was that at the end of a dissent, a justice always says as a courtesy, I respectfully dissent. And that's a, a courtesy to those in the majority. Justice Ginsburg apparently was so hot under her doily collar that she did not say respectfully. She just said, said I dissent. Uh, so she will go down in history as well um, as someone who um, really had, had an issue with the majority uh, in that case. I could go on and on on different kinds of cases, again, showing um, her impact either in the majority or as part of uh, the dissent. But I will now turn to our final topic before we turn to your questions, which I hope that you will um, submit to us. Um, the, the Supreme Court's future, uh, where do we think it's going? Well, come next Monday, which is 
by coincidence, the first Monday in October, which by tradition is when the court rises for its terms. Its terms run similar to our school years. They run from the fall through the spring into the summer and, and then they close out that term. So they usually will call it, this will be the, the 2021 term, like this is the 2021 academic year for us. So they rise the first Monday in October and when they rise, Justice Ginsburg's seat, a beautiful leather black chair uh, on the bench will be draped in black crepe and they will have black crepe in, in front of the bench where she would have sat. And though she was small of stature, not much bigger than my little doll of her sitting on my mantle today, um, she obviously filled a large seat and a large role. And it's going to be hard for anyone to take her place uh, and fill that seat. Uh, but it looks as though it will be Amy Coney Barrett. Um, what does that mean for the court? I'm sure most of you have been following the news that uh, Judge Barrett, it, she's on the Seventh Circuit. She was uh, named to that uh, circuit bench, the Court of Appeals by President Trump in 2017. So she does have uh, brief, but some judicial experience. Uh, she has been a law professor at Notre Dame where she took her degree, uh, comes from Rhodes College. Uh, in Memphis, where uh, our colleague at the Miller Center, Mike Nelson, has been a longtime political scientist. And I just wrote to him over the weekend to say, did he know her when she was there? Mike teaches in political science at Rhodes and is a non-resident fellow with us at the Miller Center. Uh, he said, I know she was an English major, but she was very highly thought of. She was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate. Um, and I pointed out to Mike that Little Rhodes College, which is a small liberal arts college, as I say in Tennessee, this is their second Supreme Court nomination. And if she becomes a justice will be their second justice. Abe Fortas uh, also went to Rhodes College. So shout out to Rhodes, well done. Uh, but justice, uh, presuming that she becomes the justice uh, who replaces Ginsburg, Justice uh, Barrett, uh, by all accounts, will be very conservative. She has a conservative record, uh, both in her writings uh, and in her rulings uh, on the Seventh Circuit. So when we say what will be the future of the court, if we're just looking purely again at that body of case work that is going to be a liberal or conservative split, uh, I should think that we can pretty safely predict that uh, Judge Barrett, Justice Barrett, will be on the conservative side. Uh, she gives no indication of uh, being open to liberal arguments, although she said uh, she will remain open to constitutional issues and statutory issues, but that she had clerked for Justice Scalia uh, and that she very much uh, believed in his uh, textualism, keeping to the text of the Constitution, the so-called original intent of the framers, and the original intent of those in Congress or those in states who write laws. Uh, whether she will hold always to precedent, which is not an absolute requirement for justices, but it's part of their tradition that they don't want precedents to change all too rapidly because then people will lose respect for them the court and the law, uh, but of course Roe versus Wade is on the line and it appears that uh, she may be the, the final important vote uh, perhaps to overturn that decision or at least uh, limit it even more severely than it has been limited. I will just end on then this note that uh, when I came to UVA as a graduate student, and uh, I should tell you that I was admitted to the Harvard PhD program, but um, I just I literally couldn't scrape up the money to get there. So uh, thanks to UVA at the time in the early 1980s, I, I got a full ride and my undergraduate professors said, you need to go to UVA and work with Henry Abraham. He's the number one scholar in political science on the court. So I did. But one of the books that he assigned uh, was called uh, the Burger Court, re referring to Warren Burger, who replaced Earl Warren. Burger was a Nixon appointee. Nixon had three other appointees. They were all thought to be conservative. But this book title by 1983 was The Burger Court, The Counter Revolution That Wasn't. And the counter revolution was meant to be Nixon's attempt to point four conservatives to the Supreme Court uh, in order to get it to overturn most of the liberal decisions of the Warren era. And it so happened that Justice Powell, who was from Richmond, uh, had been a, he was a centrist. So even though he was thought to be a conservative, he would often swing over to the liberal side. Or Justice Blackmun, who wrote the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, was thought to be a conservative by Nixon. 
he swung over to the liberal side. Political scientists have discovered that about 20% of justices in their lifetime on the court, and justices serve according to the Constitution for good behavior, which is in effect for life, that about 20% of justices stray from what their presidents hope that they will impose in their ideology. And it's usually from conservative to liberal. I just have to say that except for Chief Justice John Roberts, who has occasionally swung over to the liberal side, particularly to save uh, the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, uh, even if he does that on that case that's coming up on Obamacare on November 10th to be argued at the court, uh, that will still leave five justices, if Amy Coney Barrett is on the court by then, five justices to vote to strike it down. Um, so I don't see, except for Ju Chief Justice uh, Roberts and maybe Gorsuch. Gorsuch voted on the liberal side and led the court, wrote the opinion in the LGBTQ case uh, that applied the 1964 Civil Rights Act uh, to that community uh, this past term. So he gave a little bit of a hint that maybe he could be persuaded, but I don't see Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, um, Justice uh, Kavanaugh, or future Justice Barrett uh, strained from the conservative side. But no one thought that Justice Blackman would do that, or Justice Souter, or Justice Stevens, uh, or Justice Powell. They were all appointed by Republicans, thought to be conservative, and they ended up either being swing votes or on the liberal side. So with that, thank you for listening, and I really look forward to your questions, and Jill will now moderate those for us. Okay, we've got a couple of great questions. Um, first is, what is your view on efforts to quickly confirm Amy Coney Barrett after McConnell's refusal to confirm Justice Garland. What effect do you think this will have on the legitimacy of the court? And what do you think about the Demo Democratic proposals to then expand the size of the court, which I know yeah. we talked about? Yeah, superb question and, and keep me focused on the, the various elements of it, Jill. Um, so I should tell you, being from Louisville, uh, I, I know Mitch McConnell. <laughs> as well. And if I could just stray just a little bit to tell you a story, the Miller Center sent me to the Republican convention in 2016 in Cleveland to cover it, uh, particularly to do media. And uh, I, I ha we happened to have a, a luncheon meeting in a restaurant in Cleveland. I walked in and there was Senator McConnell having a lunch with his wife, Elaine Chow, uh, who was uh, secretary in the cabinet uh, for President Bush. He's now Secretary of Transportation for Trump. Uh, but they were having lunch with uh, Bob Dole and Orrin Hatch and a number of old guard in the Republican Party. And I, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know Justice, I don't know um, Senator McConnell so well that I can just run up and he says, oh, Barbara, but I, I knelt down, to, he was sitting and I knelt down. I said, hi, Senator, it's Barbara. Oh yes, Barbara, what, what are you doing now? I said, oh, I'm at the Miller Center at UVA. Oh, how nice for you. And this was the Tuesday of the convention. And you might remember that Monday night it began with Melania Trump plagiarizing Michelle Obama's convention speech from four years previously. So it was off to a really bad start. And McConnell looked at me, I didn't ask him like, how do you think it's going, Senator? He looked at me and he said, this guy, referring to Trump, he said, this guy could win, but I don't know how. And af ever after he would say, when asked, are you supporting Trump? He would say, I'm very, you know, laconically, I'm supporting the nominee of our party. But, you know, that once he was elected, boy, they were joined at the hip. And the one thing that Senator McConnell wants more than anything, unlike most senators, Mitch McConnell never wanted to be president. He just wanted to be the majority leader of the Senate. So one, he wants that. Therefore, two, he wants to hold on to the Senate. Three, what's really important to him as well, and to Trump and to the Republican base, is to flip the court and this will do it. And of course, that's why he wouldn't get, even give uh, the courtesy of, of a hearing, uh, a, a judicial committee hearing, or even the courtesy of meeting with Merrick Garland uh, fully eight months before the 2016 election. So this is my view on all of that. I, as a person who studied the constitution, I don't see any footnotes in the constitution that say a president's power to do anything that's listed in Article Two of the Constitution, including appointing members of the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary, ends eight months before the next election, 40 days before the next election. Uh, his power ends at one second past 
noon on inauguration day, either because he's come to the end of two terms or he's not reelected. So I'm actually not bothered by either President Obama or President Trump nominating eight months before the election or 40 days before the election. I am consistent on that. I don't, I'm not I'm not convinced at all that the difference is, oh, well, the Senate and the Supreme Court, the Senate, excuse me, and the Oval Office are in the same political party hands. That doesn't impress me. The other thing that doesn't impress me and that Democrats and Republicans have been saying are the people should decide who goes on the Supreme Court. That's not in the Constitution either. And that's the last thing the founders wanted. They didn't even want the people directly to elect the president of the United States. That's why we have an electoral college. So they sure didn't want the people to have an impact on the Supreme Court. It was supposed to be insulated. And therein lies the rub for me, is that I don't see the court being insulated from the kind of politics that the Republicans, and particularly Mitch McConnell, are playing. But I must say, it's very clever and it's very effective, and they're going to achieve Mitch McConnell's goal and the Republican goal, I suspect, of flipping the court. Now, what will this do for how people view the court? I do worry about that a lot as a former fellow there at the court. Um, and by the way, if you are interested, um, you might be more familiar with White House Fellows Program. There are also Congressional Fellows Program and there are Supreme Court Fellows Program. So these are particularly for people in mid-career. Um, my mother pointed out at the time, I'm not a lawyer, and she counted up all the people who had been judicial fellows, and she said, Barbara, three quarters of them have been lawyers. I said, I know, mother, but some have been political scientists, and so I'm, I'm going to apply. So always go for it. Um, I worry for the court as an institution. I love it as an institution. I love the presidency as an institution. I was a congressional intern uh, in college. So I love our system, and I worry about anything that draws it into the muck and mire of politics, particularly for the court, which is supposed to try to remain above that. And it has pretty much succeeded uh, over its history uh, in rising above it. Not always, it's been dragged into to politics or it has drug itself into politics. Uh, but I just read that it, its most recent Gallup poll survey on the approval rating for the Supreme Court was 58%, which is, as you know, way above where Trump has been and usually way, way above where Congress is. Uh, and what also struck me was that Republicans, Democrats, and independents were all in that range of sort of 60%, 58%, 55% on average then, 58% approval rating as of July. So I'm going to follow that closely, and you can too. Periodically, the Gallup organization asks that question. Do you have uh, faith and confidence in the court to do the right thing, or do you approve of the job the court is doing? And let's see if this uh, approach that the Republicans have used, and then as people contrast that to their approach to President Obama's attempt to name uh, Merrick Garland to the court, if that has an impact on both the Congress on the presidential election and also on how people view the court. Okay, I'm keeping my video off because I have unfortunately unstable internet. So I'm just, oh you can hear my voice. Um, hear we, voice. Part of the first question, and we have, an, we have another person asking about it too, is um, what do you think about potential proposals to oh. expand the size of the court, which I think is, the history on this is just fascinating. Yeah, thank you so much, Jill. Yes, yeah, so I'm glad people are asking that question. You might have heard that most recently from Pete Buttigieg. Uh, he was uh, proposing that as he ran for the Democratic presidential nominations in the primaries. And I, I, re I remember taking note of it because um, you rarely have heard that in contemporary times. Um, the more recent time uh, in which we heard the conversation about uh, expanding the membership of the court was in a similar time when the court was bogged down in politics uh, in the New Deal period of Franklin Roosevelt. And just real, really briefly, what had happened was that uh, landslide victory for Roosevelt in 32, reelected even bigger landslide in 1936, two thirds of the popular vote, uh, major, major majorities in the Democratic Party in the House and the Senate all through the first term of FDR, and they were passing one piece of New Deal legislation after another to try to ameliorate the effects of the Great Depression, with a quarter of the American people out of work, 25%, 28% unemployment, if you can imagine such a thing. It's horrible now, but imagine that. 
Uh, and so thank goodness for, for the New Deal to try to lift us out of that and, and control the banks and control Wall Street and get people back to work and stimulus programs, conservation programs. But just as soon as FDR would send up legislation, Congress would pass it, it would go into effect. And because it usually involved regulating business, business people, farmers who were being regulated would challenge it in the courts. And it would end up at the US Supreme Court, which was then controlled by five or six conservatives and particularly four rock rib conservatives who were called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> they were corporate lawyers. They were quite elderly. Uh, and I'm sure every night FDR prayed, please, dear Lord, take at least one, if not two of these people so I can get a liberal majority, a pro New deal majority on the court. Didn't happen. So after the landslide of 1936 and 1937, uh, FDR did one of his fireside chats in which he talked about the country being like a wagon being pulled by the three branches of government, which were represented in his uh, analogy by horses. And he said, the Congress and the presidency are two horses that are pulling in one direction, but the court is pulling in the opposite direction. Imagine what happens to a wagon when you do that. So he said, I've got this plan that I'm gonna send up to Congress to expand the membership of the court because the court is so old and elderly, they are behind in their work. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to, for every justice who's 70 or over, I am going and any president after me can appoint a new justice up to a total of 15. That is perfectly within Congress's purview because the number nine that we're all used to for the court has been in place since 1869, uh, but it can be changed by Congress. It's not written in the Constitution, and the court's membership is varied from at the start five up to ten during the Supreme during the uh, Civil War. So that can be done. But interestingly enough, I discovered in my research on that time period that even though two thirds of the popular vote had gone to Roosevelt at that time. Uh, just prior to this court packing plan, as it was called, or it would be called a court packing scheme uh, by those who opposed it, uh, never more than 50% of the American people supported it. They felt that it was a power grab uh, by FDR. And even though many people supported him and the Congress and the legislation, they really believe in separation of powers. And they thought that the court had the power to check the power of the president and the Congress, which it does. It so happened, however, that in addition to that, the then Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes went across to Congress uh, to speak to them about this court packing plan proposed by FDR, which had the premise that the court was behind in its work because it was too elderly. And here this rather elderly uh, Chief Justice reported that they were not behind in their work at all. They were completely caught up in it and with it. And therefore, this, there was no need for this plan. So it failed. And uh, it really hurt FDR's reputation at the time. But it may have been just enough to convince two members of the court to begin to change their votes from anti-New Deal to pro-New Deal. And that's what saved the subsequent New Deal legislation. So in history, that's called the switch in time that saved nine. Now, will we have it? I think if Biden is elected and the Senate goes over to the Democrats and they hold the House, I think you will hear uh, many uh, people speaking up for proposing such a plan to add members to the court. Uh, I don't know whether it will pass, and I don't know whether uh, the American people will rise up as they did against the FDR scheme to say, uh, let's leave it as is. You should know that uh, she was interviewed on this very question shortly before her passing, and Justice Ginsburg said she preferred to keep the, the number at nine. Thank you for that really enlightening, I think really enlightening answer. Um, we have a question specifically about Judge Coney Barrett, and that is, to what extent do you think her personal religious views will influence her decision making? I think a lot from what I read about her, um, just as they did uh, Justice Scalia. But I will tell you um, two stories. One about Justice Scalia that relates, I think, directly to his protege, uh, Judge Barrett. Uh, and one from Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the bench, uh, as a graduate student working on my dissertation, which was on religion, race, and gender in appointments, uh, because there had been, uh, over the time of the court's history, 
uh, this so-called representativeness, either passive representativeness, whereby a person's appointed to the court because they look like a group in America or they profess the same beliefs as a group, uh, or they just make the court slightly more diverse. This was done with geography, where a person came from in the early part of our history because geography was so important, especially up through the Civil War. Uh, then it changed over to religion. Uh, as we had waves and waves of immigrants coming to this country, many of whom were Catholic and Jewish, presidents established what came to be called a Catholic seat on the court and a Jewish seat on the court to reach out to those voters and again, make the court at least appear to be a little bit more representative. And sometimes people who were representative, as it turned out with the African-American seat, Thurgood Marshall voted in the interest of African-Americans. Uh, Justice O'Connor, even though she was a Republican, moderate, I would say moderate Republican conservative, uh, she voted almost always for women. Um, so Justice Scalia once, I, I heard him in a briefing for the Italian ambassador who had come to visit him at the court, was asked that very question about his religion and abortion. And Justice Scalia said, I am against Roe v. Wade because I don't believe that the right to abortion that was based on a right to privacy uh, and the decision to be made by a woman to have privacy over her body and reproductive rights. Justice Scalia said, I don't see one, a right to privacy in the constitution and therefore two, I cannot find a right to abortion. If Congress wants to create a federal right to that, they're more than welcome. If they want to amend the Constitution to create a right to privacy, they're more than welcome. State legislatures can create these rights. But he said, as a justice, it is my constitutional view that I cannot find a right to privacy or right to abortion. And he explicitly said, it is not my religion that is leading me in this direction. I believe that's what a justice, should she become a justice, Barrett will say, I have to believe, though, that uh, it is her, as it was for Scalia, strong, strong Catholic feelings uh, against abortion uh, that would lead them in that direction. I will also tell you at one point after the Catholic seat began to go by the wayside, and it did because, I believe, because of President Kennedy's election as the first and so far only Catholic president we've ever had. And he had to make the case, citing Thomas Jefferson, that his Catholicism, his religion was strictly private and would have no impact whatsoever on his understanding of his role as president or his role as he had been a senator and a member of the House of Representatives, or as he pointed out, no one asked him about his religion when he went to serve his country in World War II and almost lost his life in the South Pacific. And no one asked his brother what his religion was when he gave his life in World War II. So he made that Jeffersonian uh, separationist argument and I'm not seeing that from more conservative judges and justices these days, but after the Catholic seat pretty much drifted away because you ended up with three Catholics on the court, Justice Brennan, who was a liberal Catholic, who said privately he didn't agree with abortion, but he voted for Roe v. Wade uh, and the majority opinion in that case. Justice Kennedy was a moderate uh, Republican, moderate conservative, and a swing voter. He has preserved, he preserved the right to abortion, but put some limitations on it. And then we had Justice Scalia in the opposite uh, part of the spectrum, uh, who believed, as I say, that there was no right to abortion in the Constitution or right to privacy. So I believe that Justice Barrett will be closer to Justice Scalia. I believe her Catholicism, which is highly conservative, will inform that, but I believe she will say, as Justice O'Connor said to me when I asked her about her gender and its impact on her, she said, we are all the sum total of our experiences, but she said, every day when I cross the threshold of this court building, I attempt to leave that behind and be a judge and decide based on the Constitution and the laws that are in front of me. Okay, I'm going to try to combine two questions that we have about the legitimacy of the court. Okay. One, one is, what do you think about the idea of lifetime sentences for the Supreme Court justices, and what kind of effect do you think that has on the legitimacy of the court and public trust? And then the second question is, how far do you think we can push these democratic institutions like the court before they become um, untrustworthy or at risk of failure? Can we come back from the current levels of the political polarization and around the process? 
Right. Well, hold, hold that one. That's a great one as well as the first one about um, the, the life sentence. I think perhaps the questioner meant tenure. <laughs> a life sentence is what we do with people in jail. Yeah. Um, but it, sometimes it feels like a sentence if you don't agree with that justice. Uh, but as I say, the court uh, has, members of the court have what is called uh, tenure for good behavior, according to the Constitution, and that in the end has really meant lifetime tenure. And we have had these examples that actually had become rarer, that is, justices had tended to retire because obviously people are living longer now. Uh, Professor Abraham used to say that the uh, longevity of Supreme Court justices is second only to symphony orchestra conductors, uh, and I think he was right about that. Um, that we attended in these later years because people were living longer, better medical care. Lots of justices have had heart disease, they've had cancer, but it's been treated. Uh, and they have then stepped off when they feel like they need to step off or they want to go into retirement as Justice Kennedy did most recently. But in these last 15 years, we've had three justices die on the bench. So you had Chief Justice Rehnquist pass from cancer. He refused to leave even though he had a fatal diagnosis. The same for Justice Ginsburg. And then the sudden uh, heart uh, death, heart disease uh, took Justice Scalia. Um, so, my view is I'm okay with the life tenure. Um, I, I actually believe that does help to um, secure that position and keep them above politics. So I'm, I'm not opposed to it. My dad used to say as he got into his 80s and he was sharp as a tack until he passed, but he'd say, I, I know my mind isn't as sharp as when I was in my 50s or 60s. Um, but even so, we've had some justices like Justice Stevens uh, who did ultimately retire, but he was in his 90s, and, and he was sharp and excellent. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, 87, was sharp until the end. Uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, served until he was in his 90s. Um, so I'm, I'm really not as bothered by that, and even if I were, or even if we are and say there should be a, a term limit of, let's say, a long term, 18 years or so, um, it would have to, we'd have to change the Constitution, and it's almost impossible to get amendments like that through. Um, was the second question, Jill, about legitimacy? Oh, how, how far can we push the, the institutions? Yes. Oh, uh, whoever asked that question, that keeps me up at night. Uh, I have that same thought and fear like I've never had before. I had a little bit of it in the Bush v. Gore era um, that I was sorry that um, that really both sides were sort of dragging the courts into these highly political questions. In fact, I wrote an op-ed during Bush v. Gore at the very beginning saying that the court also has another doctrine I mentioned to you that they uh, can take sort of a restraintist approach and uphold uh, their precedents. Uh, but a colleague and I were writing that they also have a doctrine called the political question doctrine, and they can sidestep an issue and say they're not going to decide it because it's too political and it should be left up to the people or the political branches. And yet they took Bush v. Gore, um, although that when they took the first case, uh, they tried to, to turn it back to the state court in Florida, uh, but then when the case came back to them, uh, as Bush v. Gore, they decided they had to make the decision. And they are the final say in the short run, so they do have to do that. Um, I, but I, I've never been as worried as I am now and about our institutions, and that's because, one, we have an incumbent president uh, who has pushed, uh, at, at best, has pushed aside norms, at worst has obliterated them. And one of my colleagues uh, at the Miller Center previously now um, has moved on, but he's written a book recently on the presidency in which he says, when norms, particularly related to the presidency, are broken or smashed or obliterated, they rarely come back. So that concerns me. Uh, the kind of things we've been talking about with the Supreme Court appointment and what happened to Merrick Garland, uh, that concerns me about uh, how the Senate has, has handled that. Uh, and I'm, I'm not as concerned per se with the court becoming conservative because sometimes in its history it's been conservative and sometimes it's been liberal. Um, but I really, I like justices like Justice O'Connor, Justice Kennedy, Justice Powell. I like the swing voters. And the year that I was there, not being a lawyer, but surrounded by lawyers, they would, they would always uh, 
denigrate the intellect of Justice O'Connor and Justice Kennedy because they were centrist and they'd say, well, you know, they're not as bright as Justice Scalia. And I'd say, really? Just because they're moderates? That's where most Americans tend to be, I think, even in this polarized time. And so I like the fact that Justice O'Connor had been a politician. She had been the first woman uh, Senate majority leader of a state Senate in, th in the 50 states. And she knew the people and she knew where she needed to land. And she, yes, would find a way to support that with her understanding of the Constitution and the laws. But um, I'm, a, I'm a centrist myself. I'm a moderate myself. And um, so I'd, I'd like to see at least one or two people on the court uh, who could pr represent that. And I think that's what Chief Justice uh, Roberts has been trying to do because he believes in the institution. So to your question, I am really worried about uh, the, the holding up of our democratic system right now and our constitutional system. And I, I literally pray every day uh, for our country and that our system can hold and that the center can hold. Barbara, that was not the answer I wanted to hear from you. I wanted you to say it always, this always happens. We just don't remember it. But it's good to be in the know regardless. Well, let me say this. It, it doesn't always happen. But as I say, even with the court, it has been grossly divided sometimes on one side or the other. I, I grew up seeing uh, billboards in Louisville that said impeach Earl Warren. So the right was upset at, at him. So I, I, that part I get. Um, but I, don't, I feel like, except for the Civil War, our, our three branches of government and our constitutional structure have never been under such fire. And that mm -hmm. does worry me. But the good news is, it has always survived. We even survived the Civil War. I hope for the best now. Um, I think, we, if you don't mind, we have time for maybe one more question. And oh, it sort of picks up on what you just said. And that is, um, do you think the three branches of our federal government do have truly equal power as was the design goal. If you, if so, could you expand on how the court holds its own? And if not, um, could you talk about which branches have more or less power? Yes, I'll, I'll refer to Professor Abraham again, uh, wrote a uh, seminal textbook called The Judicial Process, which he based on his favorite a judicial book or legal book, which was by uh, Justice Benjamin Cardozo, among his favorite justices, who sat in the Jewish seat, by the way. Um, and in, in Professor Abraham's book, The Judicial Process, which was one of the first comparative texts to compare the American judicial system to uh, those in, in, in Europe, for example, under parliamentary systems. Uh, but it's it's still even though you know he's passed on and, and that book has not been up, updated in, in recent years, he had a, a, a piece in the back that answered this very question that said with data that at various times in our country's history and he even included a graph about it, uh, one inevitably it seems one branch will be out in front of the others in terms of leadership. And it, it just so happens based on who's president, uh, who's in the Congress, which parties are in control, and how the court is fitting into that. So I am not bothered, again, by one branch being out in front of the others as, as leaders. I, for example, as a pro-civil rights person, am glad that the Supreme Court was out in front of Congress, which was governed by white supremacists and the seniority system uh, through the 20th century. In 1954, I'm glad the court came out uh, nine to nothing led by Earl Warren and, and promulgated Brown versus Board of Education 10 years before the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, I'm glad when the Supreme Court uh, needs to decide in a case that will lead to justice for all and they're out in front because they're protected from politics typically and, and they take the lead. Uh, we do have separation of powers. The founders wanted those powers to be balanced. Some political scientists have talked in terms of separated yet shared powers because in addition to, to separation of powers, the, court, the courts, the president, and the Congress check and balance each other. Uh, what we all hate to see is for too long a period of time, one branch way ahead of the others uh, leading, perhaps taking on too much power, and especially if we think that that power is no longer tied to the majority of what Americans think. So that's the that's a long, I realize, and, and somewhat convoluted answer, but I think it's based in the history that Professor Abraham had written about, which I think is very accurate 
Uh, and, and yet it says what our worries are when those separation of powers, checks and balances, those are at the very heart of our constitutional system, which were meant to prevent one branch of government from becoming too powerful and yet allow the system to work. We, I think, get worried that the system is not working and that one branch or the other may be out in front of the others and, again, not representing the majority of the American people. Well, I think that's about our time, and I just cannot thank you enough. It's very, I've been getting texts and mes private messages from so many people saying, um, echoing their thanks for you being with us today and saying how interesting and important your discussion has been. So I just want to thank you on behalf of the school and I guess it's a to be continued, right? We could do a dot, dot, dot and revisit, revisit this discussion in a few months, maybe. I hope we'll have a chance to do that. So Jill, thank you again so much and Millie for getting everything together technologically and to Batten for all the good work you do. And I hope we'll all have an opportunity. We could have gone on, I'm sure for another hour, but yes, more to come. And uh, everyone just remember this final word, I will say, the Supreme Court did not have its own building until the 1930s. It met in the Capitol, if you can believe that. So not much separation of powers there. So it, it had its building built in the midst of the depression. And when then Ch Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes laid the cornerstone, he said, the Republic endures and this is a symbol of its faith. So hold on to that and be well. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Have a, have a good rest of your day.